This program on women in science, technology, and business has been brought to you by Zoho Corporation. Hello, I'm Kamla, and in our series on women in technology, our guest today is Steffi Pepke. She's co-founder of Open Source Robotics Foundation, located right here in Mountain View, and she's also the lead user experience. And today, we are going to be talking robots and design. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Steffi, how did you get involved in uh, robots? You are a psychology major. Yes, yeah, so I studied psychology at UC Santa Cruz, and when I came out of undergrad, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, and I ended up in an internship at Willow Garage, which was um, a kind of unusual robotics R&D company on Willow Road in Menlo Park. And which is right in your backyard. Yes, yeah, I grew up uh, very close to Willow Garage. Okay. Um, and I started doing um, just sort of assisting with lunch and with inventory management, all kinds of things. And I was very, very intrigued by robots, and I wanted to figure out how to combine psychology with robotics. Um, and then a woman named Leila Takeyama began at Willow Garage. She was leading up the human robot interaction research effort, so HRI. And I became her research assistant, so we worked together for a you while. You became her research assistant, or you persuaded her to become? Oh, yeah, a little of both. <laughs> um, and, and so that's when I realized how I could combine my interest in technology with my background in psychology and my interest in how people think and, and work and interact with technology. And uh, then I went to Carnegie Mellon University and got a master's in human-computer interaction, which is HCI. So that's how you got your introduction. So we have a picture there of uh, Pepper. Yes. And that's a humanoid robot. And uh, I have a story for you. Okay. I just met Pepper two months ago in San Jose. And there were like two Peppers. And it looked at me and said, would you like a hug? Okay. And I just stood there, like a lot of people. I'm, I don't know what to do when I see a robot. So I just stood there uh -huh. and it said, oh, you're one of those. Oh, <laughs> a snarky little robot. <laughs> yeah. And this is Gazebo? Yes, yes. This is Gazebo, which is uh, the main project I work on at the Open Source Robotics Foundation. It's a physics-based robot simulator. It's essentially a video game for your robot, um, but a very physically accurate video game. So you can run your code in simulation on a virtual model of your robot before running the code on your physical robot. So it saves uh, development time and money. It's a great development tool. And this is from the uh, DARPA Robotic Challenge? Yes, this is Chimp. And Chimp did not win, but Chimp did very well. This was uh, the robot from Carnegie Mellon University, and I think another university was also on that team. They're one of the only robots that fell and was able to get back up during the competition. Most robots had to be, or I think all other robots had to be picked up manually. So they needed very assistance. Impressive. Correct, yeah. Okay. But this one got up on its own. And this one? Yeah, this is one of the Atlas robots. I believe there were seven or eight of these models competing in the finals. This one is from IHMC. That's a group out in Florida. Um, they also did very well. Um, it's a very impressive humanoid. It's pretty massive. Mm. And this is your robot? This is not. I wish it were. This oh. is um, called Val, Valkyrie. It is made by NASA. And they were going to... Valkyrie is the plane. Val yeah, Valkyrie is also this robot. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I love about this robot is that it is one of the only ones, if not the only, that is based more on the female form than on the male form. So oh. the battery pack, it's a little difficult to tell from up here, but the chest is a little bit more feminine than a typically masculine robot. It reminded me of Terminator. Interesting, yeah, I think it's so much nicer looking. <laughs> oh, okay. So those are all our images of when we think of robots, mm -hmm. and I think Pepper is the closest that comes to a social robot. Yeah, I think, uh, so Pepper is made by Aldebaran, uh, and... It's I, a French company? It is a French company. I think they're now owned by SoftBank. Okay. Um, or that's one of the funders. And uh, yeah, Pepper's meant as a social robot to kind of interact with you at home. So that's, uh, of the robots we looked at, the closest to a commercial robot. The other ones are still research hmm. platforms. So you started Willow Garage, which is an incubator for robotic, a lot of robotic companies in the Bay Area. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of companies ended up spinning out from Willow Garage. And your open source is also... 
a yeah. spin-off from there. Yeah, yeah, we started there. So all of the co-founders were originally at Willow Garage in some capacity. And um, we spun out when the DARPA Robotics Challenge was starting. And we provided the software for a lot of that competition. So this is 2012? Yes. OK. So the DARPA Robotic Challenge was a three-year challenge? 2013? 2012 or 2013, yes. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, two and a half or three years. Because you had to go through a series. First, you had to tell us how the challenge was set up. Because I think it culminated earlier this year with, I think, five or six of them participating somewhere here in the Bay Area. So, yes, yeah, so it was a multi-year project. And it started off with the virtual robotics challenge, which is the part we were most heavily involved in. Um, so they used your uh, gazebo. Exactly, yep. OK. So teams competed to win an Atlas robot, which is one of the robots we saw. And um, to prove that they were, you know, skillful and, and so they were incentivized. Yes, yeah, like a, yeah. It was like a gaming thing. Yeah, yeah. And and so if they won this robot, then that's what they would compete in the next round with. So they competed on a few search and rescue like tasks in the simulator, and the teams that did the best won an Atlas robot. Then the next phase was the DARPA robotics um, midterm. So I don't remember what it was called, but. Um, the first part of the challenge, the physical challenge. And that was in Florida. And robots, there were a bunch of teams with different robots. And they had to do a variety of search and rescue tasks, like walk over uneven terrain, climb a ladder, drive the vehicle. Um, and then the teams that did the best, and then some additional teams also um, moved on to the finals. And those just happened in June of this year, and down in Pomona. And uh, a team from Korea, from South Korea, won that. Hmm. Yes, I remember the team. Uh, mm -hmm. I think people were surprised that a South Korean team won. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because they were probably thinking that an American team would win. Probably, yeah. There were Primarily, it was American teams. But yeah. there were a lot of very, very good teams from okay. internationally. Did you go and uh, see the Pomona one? Oh, yeah. We sent the whole company. It was a lot of fun. Oh, so you do get excited when you look oh, at yeah. it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, earlier today, before I started this interview, I was talking to a, a bunch of women. And I said, oh, one of the people I'm interviewing is uh, in the robotics industry. They're like, really? Robots are going to take over our world. What is going to happen to us in 20 years? We're going to be left with no jobs. Do you ever get that kind of a reaction? I get that a lot. And Why I can, is that? Um, I can understand it. It's sort of... The field is developing very quickly, and so there's a lot of unknown where we'll go. And I think often when things are unknown, people freak out a little bit. Um, so yeah, I find a lot of adults wonder, oh, are they going to take over? Are we going to lose all our jobs? Are they going to, is there going to be a robot uprising? And uh, I just don't, I don't worry about that. I think that fear, uh, if you really sort of uh, try to identify where that comes from, if you look at the robotics industry, there's no evidence that robots are dangerous or going to be very dangerous or take over in the near future. So where does that idea come from? And I, I think it's directly from Hollywood. So the movies we see are robots that are depicted as being very dangerous, Terminator, HAL. Um, or Ex Machina. Yes, exactly. The sentient uh, yes, robot. Yes, yes. Um, and so if you kind of brush that Hollywood effect to the side, you, what's left is the, is the actual robotics industry, which is very capable technology um, that can do a lot of good. And people that are largely not evil and very intelligent that are pushing this technology to make life better for people. So that's really what robotics is about. But what about Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking? They, they are on Hollywood's side. They are. Um, I mean, you can worry about these sorts of things, but uh, one thing I would respectfully point out when people mention that is that uh, they're not actually in the field of artificial intelligence, and I'm not either. So I can pontificate about it, but uh, I'm just not. I'm just not worried about that. What about your dad? He's he's a computer science engineer. Yes. Who teaches at Stanford? Uh, he does research there. Yes. Okay. So so you must have had conversations with him. We have. Yeah. I think generally we kind of laugh together about that notion that but does he have any concerns at all no no he doesn't worry i mean so i should say that you know computers robots ai all those things are tools mm. and a tool can be used to do good or bad by a human so if 
AI or robots do something bad, it's the human doing that, not the tool itself. So yeah, I think often we forget that it's a human being. Yeah, you can't decouple those two. It's yeah. the human behind it. So that's what we would need to worry about, not about the technology itself. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah. So the DARPA challenge was directly in uh, response to the Fukushima that's why you had this search and rescue effort and they had to go through uneven terrain and all of that. Exactly, yeah. So the the program was inspired by the Fukushima, the meltdown that happened. And um, it was determined that, you know, there were a number of uh, tasks that if someone had been able to do them, the uh, damage would not have been quite as great. But humans couldn't go in because it was too dangerous. And so the hope was that robots could do this, but we realized that robots are not capable enough. And so... Um, Gil Pratt, who was at DARPA, he was a program manager there, came up with the idea for this challenge. And uh, really the goal was to um, sort of catalyze um, development in this area and get robots to the point where they can do simple, what, we can, what are simple to us tasks, like walking over terrain that's uneven, because um, that's very difficult for robots to do right now. They lose their footing constantly. Um, you know, opening doors is very difficult for robots. Getting out of a vehicle is very difficult. So there's a lot of work we need to do to get robots to be as agile as we are as humans. Hmm. So tell us a little bit about the Open Source Robotics Foundation. It was spun off from Willow Garage. Mm -hmm. What do you do? What does the organization do? Yeah, so we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We're located in Mountain View. And our mission is to support the development, distribution, and adoption of open source software in robot uh, research, education, product development. So all of the software we develop is open source. And we have two kind of main products. Uh, the first is ROS, Robot Operating System. And uh, we're the primary maintainers and developers on that, but the community is vibrant and international, so we have people contributing from all over. And at a high level, ROS is an ecosystem of robot tools and libraries. So it's the software that runs in robots, and it can run in drones, in humanoids, in industrial arms, all kinds of robots. Um, and then the second product we have is Gazebo, that we saw the image of that earlier. Uh, okay, which is a, where you a can come and run your code and see if it is uh, if everything's good. Okay, yep. if it's kosher. Yes, is okay. the code kosher. Yeah, okay. I like that. Code, okay, code kosher. <laughs> so uh, was Ross developed at Willow Garage? Ross, um, that's where it really kind of kicked into high gear. I believe it originated at Stanford a mm. while ago. Um, with the Was it with the car, the Stanford the solar um, car thing? I'm not sure if they used Ross, but I don't believe it was in that lab. Um, uh, but, you know, a lot of money was pumped into the project at Willow Garage, and that's when it really took off and... Willow Garage had a lot of interns coming in and out, and so those interns learned Ross and then took Ross out to their research labs, and that's a, you know that played a big role in Ross kind of spreading across the world. So, is it one of the main operating systems for uh, the robot in the robotics industry? Um, it's definitely one of the front runners. Yeah. Who, who are the others? I'm not actually sure which one. We focus really just on open source stuff, and Got so you. a lot of companies write their own. That's the, that's the issue. So, so the proprietal one is there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so when you have uh, open source, then you can work with, collaborate with a lot of other companies or projects or research labs. Yeah. If it is closed system. Yeah, you, you don't make progress nearly as quickly. So the, the beauty of open source is that um, anyone can take take code that's in this repository and do whatever they want with it. So they can commercialize on it, they can make money, they don't owe us anything. And it just sort of lights a fire under um, the development in the robotics field. And it makes it possible to make progress much more quickly than if we were all working in a silo. So, you know, the companies who, who don't use ROS and have their proprietary stuff, it's, um, you know, it's exactly what they need and that makes sense, but it, it doesn't really help us progress in the field quite as much because okay. there's no sharing. So you're a lead user experience and you're the only non-engineer on your team? Yes, yes, so I'm the lead user experience designer. Um, so I do... Use and a non-engineer? Yes, yeah, I do not have an engineering background. Do you have to be an engineer to be considered to be part of the science and tech uh, movement? I, I used to think so, and I've convinced myself that that's not the case. So, Why? Um, you know, certainly robotics is an extremely technical field, no doubt. Um, but there are so many aspects of the field 
of the robotics field that are not technical in the uh, traditional sense. Um, and all these fields are all these sort of components are required to make robotics successful. So um, you have what the robot looks like, which is kind of an aesthetic thing, which is maybe industrial design. Um, you have user experience design, which will determine how people interact with the robot. You know, do you use gestures? Is it voice recognition? All of these things you need to think about because robots, as we move forward, are going to play a bigger role in our life. And everyone needs to be able to interact with a robot and be comfortable doing that. Um, and so there are these more sort of social science-like fields that play a huge role in robotics. So uh, it's, you know, there are many opportunities to work in this highly technical robotics field without having a traditionally technical background. And that, that makes it so exciting and appealing to a lot of different types of people. So what do you do as a lead user experience? What do you do? Yeah, I, um, I kind of design anything that is user facing. So mm. um, if you take Gazebo, for example. No, let's take uh, Pepper. <laughs> take Pepper, so. <laughs> <laughs> Would you have written that thing? Oh, you're one of those. <laughs> <laughs> if I was feeling snarky, I might have. Um, so if I were working on Pepper, I may have, um, yeah, come up with a sort of interaction method, like what's the kind of personality that Pepper has? A user experience designer came up with that, not us, because we didn't build it, but um, a user experience person and a, maybe an um, industrial designer came up with the form. How do you shape the, the chassis of the robot to look non-threatening and to look approachable? Do you want it to be cute or not? So all these things were designed my guess is by a user experience designer. So when you looked at Atlas, what was it as a user experience person that drew you to Atlas? Um, that was more sort of awe. So awe, I, why? Um, it's just a very impressive machine. I mean, it's, it's huge. It has a huge battery pack, and uh, I would not say that it's so a friendly-looking robot. <laughs> but break down the Atlas for us, the Atlas. What does it have? What, are, what is inside, underneath Atlas? What does it have? Lots of hardware. I, I couldn't tell you yet. Oh, but what kind of hardware would it have? Um, so it has motors to run all of the joints. So it probably has a lot of degrees of freedom in its arms and its legs. So lots of motors. Um, there's various sensors, cameras, um, and these sensors, you know, pull in data from the environment and tell the robot and the software how to how to respond. You know, if it's trying to walk, it'll look at the ground and kind of maybe make a point cloud of, of what the terrain looks like in front of it. And then all that sensor data feeds into the decision making process of how the robot is going to traverse uneven what terrain. What we as human beings take for granted, it has to yep. compute it. Yep, exactly. We don't even really think twice about it. We just say, okay, you know, don't lose your footing and then we go. But the robot needs to be very uh, precise with its calculations and its decisions about where it will place its feet and how to balance out the weight because it's a very top heavy machine. Um, so there's a lot of uh, little things that go into moving a robot and that's why robots have such a long way to go before they're able to really be very useful mm. as humanoids. Yeah. Yeah. So let's revisit this point about whether you have to be an engineer mm -hmm. to be considered as part of science, STEM education, for instance. Sure. You know? So the emphasis is on science and technology. Were you good at math? I was not very good at math. I could do it, you know, if I worked really, really hard, I could do it, but I did not enjoy it. <laughs> but you were still interested in being part of the tech community. Yeah, yeah. So what was the path that you took? Because maybe in your story, there are there is a lesson for the rest of us to learn that you don't have to be focused in math and science. There are other ways for you to get involved in science and technology. Yeah, certainly. I think there are so many opportunities for people to get involved. It doesn't matter really if you have a technical background. So um, I think the, the way to do it is just kind of think about robots and what is exciting. You know, if you're thinking about getting into robotics, what is exciting about the robot? What, what's the interesting part to you? And then you can pursue, you know, internships or education in that realm and focus on robots, so it can be visual design. You know, some robots have interfaces that are like screens, and those things all need to be designed. There's a lot of thought that goes into these things. So, um, yeah, there are many, many opportunities for that. Did you think when you were doing psychology that you would end up in the robotics industry? No, no, not at all. I, I never even really thought about robots that much. When was know. the first time you saw a robot? Um, was it at Willow Garage? I think so. Yeah, I think so. There was the PR2. That they were working on. Which is the on. personal robot. Yep, personal robot 2. I guess it was the second mm. version. 
and it was just so impressive. It looked kind of like a gorilla. It was on four little wheels and had two big arms. And it's just thrilling being around that sort of technology because the, the potential is so um, kind of beyond what you can believe. You know, it's really like the future and it, it's just so exciting. So, so, uh, so from psychology, you worked at uh, Willow Garage and then Leila uh, Takeyama. Yep, that's right. Tell us a little bit about her. She works at Google? She's at Google now, yep. Um, I'm not entirely sure what she's working on there, but she No, was, no, but she's at Google. Yep. And she uh, is some, one of the few women in the robotics industry? Yeah, there's certainly more women than there were, you know, a few years ago. Um, but she is kind of, yeah, an expert in human-robot interaction and... I uh, was at Willow and did a lot of great research there. And I'm assuming that she's doing that at Google now, too. And she's the one who kind of influenced you and guided you. Yeah. She was your mentor. Yeah, definitely. It was, um, you know, not an official mentorship. Right. Um, those, those definitely exist, too. But it was, for me, that was um, kind of a pivotal moment when I realized that you know, here was this woman doing great work in a male-dominated environment, and she was just doing an awesome job and doing research that was interesting to her and that would make um, robots more approachable in the future. And that was just so exciting, and it really inspired me to, uh, you know, pursue my master's in human-computer interaction. And just, I think it's very important for, for anyone, but especially women who are interested in technology, to have that sort of mentor, even if it's uh, just a casual mentorship. Mm. Uh, it really makes a big difference. What was it like to study at Carnegie Mellon? Because it's one of the places to go for if you're interested in robotics. Yeah, yeah, they have a great robotics institute. Were you, were you the only one who was different in your grad class? Um, I was definitely the, the robot girl. I was the one <laughs> who, uh, who had been in robotics before and really wanted to get into it before. Um, I d unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to do too much robotics work there. I did a little bit of research. Um, but they have a lot of great, great things coming out of their robotics institute. And you wanted to come right back to the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah. You didn't want to stay in the East Coast. No, I, you know, I grew up in California. and it, you grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up in the Bay Area, so it's, it's tough to leave for an extended time. Okay. So uh, you are not only involved with uh, the Open Source Robotics Foundation, but you're also involved in helping and, I guess, mentoring uh, women and kids in, yeah. in the field of science and technology. Yeah, yeah. So I believe very passionately that, uh, especially with getting women into STEM careers or, or robotics in general, um, you really, we really need to take, the women who are in the field need to really take an initiative and um, become mentors for people. So uh, through OSRF, we do internship programs. So we take Google Summer of Code interns, which tend to be as predominantly men. Um, and a program was started, it used to be called Outreach Program for Women, um, that just had found internships for women, and I mentored some folks from, from that program. They're now called um, Outreachy. It's a similar program. Um, so I mentor people through that, and then um, I also am a mentor for something called Chick Tech, which is a, yes, <laughs> it's a specific name. Uh, it is... It's catchy. It's catchy. Yep, it's catchy. Uh, and the goal there is to get girls who are in high school who are showing promise in STEM classes um, to kind of sort of set them up with mentors if they're interested and inspire them to maybe pursue that in undergrad or... Would you put yourself back, uh, you know, 10 years and you're in that part of the Chick Tech program, uh -huh. you're a student, do you think you would have been drawn towards robotics then? Because you didn't like math and science. Yeah, I, I definitely would have been very intimidated by that. And I would have thought... See, see, yeah. see, that's the point I'm trying to get, that if you're not good in math and science, can you still make it in yep. science and tech? Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm, you know, mentoring in this program. And I uh, have made it very clear that I'm a designer in the field and not an engineer. And my hope there is to sort of inspire girls to, to realize that, you know, if they want to do the math and science part, they absolutely should. That's great. Um, but even if they are not as interested in that, um, there's still so much you can contribute to this field of robotics. Hmm. What do you want to do next? Oh, I would love to uh, work on hardware. So we do software. Oh, you didn't know what the hardware was under that robot? Oh, yeah, I don't <laughs> want to build the robot. I want to design it. <laughs> okay, so, so what would you want to do then? Um, I think it would be interesting just to 
uh, take a more industrial design approach to robots and really determine what the form is like and what the form communicates to people that it interacts with. Um, that's something that would be very interesting. So take the visual thing to the next level. Yeah, yeah. Your interest in design yeah. to the next level. Uh, where would you go there uh, to? Oh, I don't know. There are so many cool robotics companies, but I'm, for the time being, very happy at OSRF. So. OK. So um, is there anything that you wanted to do in the ro robotics field that you have not done? Have not done. Um, because you've been involved for a long time, Willow yeah. Garage, and then went to school and you're back. So, yeah, that's true. Willow Garage started in 2007, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, it's been a while. You know, mm -hmm. so you have been part of the uh, groundswell. Mm -hmm. That's so, true. So, is there anything else that is there anything cool that you'd like to do in 2016? In 2016, what's coming up? Um, I think the next big thing in in robotics is going to be autonomous vehicles and drones. Oh, um, so you see the Google car all the time? All the time, yeah. <laughs> Did you see the little buggy, buggy yeah, car? Yeah, yeah. I've I just those. saw it two days ago, and I was driving behind it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They got pulled over recently for yes. driving too slow. <laughs> Oh, that was pretty charming. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's that's the uh, uh, visual designer in you yeah. talking. <laughs> you know, Steffi, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully, you're back sometime, and maybe we can talk about Google Car at that time. Yeah, who knows? Maybe if Google talks to me. Maybe, yes. <laughs> <laughs> leave a message. <laughs> I leave a message. <laughs> Steffi, thank you so much for stopping by and talking to us about robots, which are the next new cool, cool thing to happen. You yes. Know, maybe in the next four years, we'll have robots running all over Mountain View. That would be really, really, really ridiculously <laughs> exciting. <laughs> and Miss <Ms>. Pepper. <laughs> yes, Pepper's everywhere. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thanks. And thank you for watching. If you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Kamla. We shared Steffi's uh, Twitter handle is Steffi Bot. Yes. <laughs> what an interesting Twitter handle. Steffi Bot <laughs> is a Twitter handle. And if you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, feel free to email us. Until next time, goodbye. This program on women in science, technology, and business has been brought to you by Zoho Corporation.